friends. And just to share with everybody, this is going to be live on Facebook too. So those who have not been able to join in out here, I'm sure people will be joining in because I can see a lot of new people are coming in. Those who have not been able to join yet or those who are having a challenge in connectivity, they can always log into the Facebook page and enjoy the webinar. So let me introduce the speaker to all. Today's speaker for the evening has my proud privilege to welcome Mr. B. Gautam Baliga. Mr. Gautam Baliga is a director of Opal HVS Engineers Private Limited Mumbai, a company which specializes in HVS systems for healthcare pharmaceutical industrial HVS systems. He's also a partner with RS Kulkani HVSCR Engineers Pune. He's a graduate mechanical engineer from IIT Kharagpur 1979 batch. So he has been to Calcutta and he has been to West Bengal and he knows, I'm sure, about Mr. Doi and has worked with Voltas Limited for eight years. He's an active member of ISHRE, in which he has been on the editorial board of ISHRE Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Journal. He's a chair for the Healthcare Technical Group, which is tasked to bring out healthcare guide for HVAC for healthcare spaces later this year. Mr. Gautam is the panel of ISHRE DL and lectures on topics related to clean room and healthcare. And today's webinar lecture is titled Air Conditioning of Operation Theatres a very pertinent and important topic and where we cannot even think about a place with, which could not have air conditioning. So air conditioning must in an OT. So the operation theater is perhaps the most critical space in hospital where the patient is in very susceptible condition and the body parts get exposed to a whole lot of contaminants. The air conditioning system for the operation theater should prevent chances of airborne contamination and the lecture presents engineering solutions to achieve this and improve the patient outcomes. <coughs> Excuse me. So now, without further ado, I would request Mr. Baliga, Gautamji, please take over. And I have, you have the sharing and the viewing, sharing rights. So you can please put up your presentation. I welcome you, all. welcome Mr. Baliga to this webinar. Please, sir. And the presentation is visible, sir. Great. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Somajit. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you. I see so many friends among those who are the attendees. I feel so happy. Uh, in fact, I have very fond memories of Calcutta. I did my entire education out there. I was in South Point School, by the way, before going to Kharagpur. Okay, <laughs> and uh, I was in Garihat, Lake Market area, and all that sort of thing. Uh, I have to thank Somojit, Nilanjana, and Amitava for inviting me for this webinar. And as you know, my topic is air conditioning of operation theaters. The microbial contamination of operation theaters is a major cause of nosocomial infections. It is considered to be a risk factor for surgical site infections called SSI. SSI delays wound healing, prolongs hospitalization, increases morbidity, and the oral costs. At times, it can be fatal. The air conditioning system has to ensure that microbes in the air stream do not reach the surgical site. For this reason, the HVACR engineer can do a lot to ensure the well-being of the patient in the operation theater. This presentation is of 90 slides. And Somojit told that he wants this kind of a long presentation and that's how it's so long. But fortunately, what I've done is I've made it into two parts. First is of general interest and rather light to understand, though it's a heavy topic. The second part is for the diehards, which is on coil and coil design and validation for operation theaters. So 
that's how it goes so with this background let me start my presentation so this is what it is yeah the things i'll be covering here is infection issues engineered solutions maintenance and validation what are the infection issues with operation theaters you know these are the findings of the international nosocomial infection control consortium what is nosocomial nosocomial is the disease that a patient acquires because of the hospital stay the patient did not have it at the time of admission so this is the result of a study of infection rates in six cities of india and the participating uh, hospitals are some of the eminent hospitals so this is the rates related to these eminent hospitals and if you talk of the hospitals at large i'm sure it is going to be far far more than the rates we are talking here so you can see there amrita institute fortis tata memorial hiranandani then ruby hospital kokilaben max uh, then military hospital jodhpur holy spirit hospital mumbai these are the ones who volunteered for this you know survey and it had covered cases from 2005 to 2011 it was one of the most extensive surveys and it covered 28340 procedures and this is the type of uh, infection rates that we are talking of if you have got hip prosthesis we are talking of 2.1% vaginal hysterectomy is 2.5% it goes all the way to breast surgery at 8.3% knee prosthesis is 1.7% and the average is 4.2% that means out of every 100 who get admitted four are likely four or more are definitely likely to get nosocomial disease now there are some procedures for which this has been analyzed in terms of the magnitude in various uh, you know situation in various places one is your ventilator associated pneumonia uh, central line associated blood stream infection clapsi then Uh, catheter associated urinary tract infections and rates are expressed in infections per 1000 device days these are on devices that get attached and we are talking of per 1000 device, device days so if you look at uh, the rates which we are talking of per 1000 device days is you know for ventilator associated pneumonia it goes to 0.9 for usa 13.1 for developing countries india is 19.8 so similarly you got for clapsi and catheter uh, associated urinary tract infection see we are far about other developing countries uh, these are the developing countries which would include you know ceylon i mean you are sri lanka and all you know our neighbors and this is where we are you know the highest in the developing countries and what is the cost of hais you can just uh, make an estimate for yourself antibiotics if you are getting if someone is getting admitted for you know these kind of uh, uh, nosocomial infections it is 18000 per day and you will be hospitalized for 7 to 14 days and cost of added cost of stay in the icu is 30000 to 1 lakh per day depending on which hospital you are in so that gives you a cost of nosocomial infection it's amazingly high and uh, you know should be we should make all our efforts to try and avoid these kind of infections so let's come to what is it that we need to do let us understand what are the contamination pathways so in contamination you have got a source from which it comes then there is a transport mechanism to reach the contamination whether it's the whichever pathogen whether it's the virus bacteria or any other pathogen uh, 
contact with the susceptible site and retention at the susceptible site so the idea is if you can have a break in the pathway at any point whether at the source or during the transport or you prevent the contact with the susceptible site then you are in a position to prevent this retention at the susceptible site so what happens as far as the operation theater is concerned what are the roots of sur uh, surgical infection you got the adjacent area you might be having the sterile spore from which you could transport it into the uh, your uh, operation theater or you may have to go through the clean corridor then you got a floor you know on which you are taking the trolley for all the instruments then you got the operating personnel who are also a source for the surgical infection then you got the operating room air how clean is that air then you got the patient's own skin you know the adjoining skin uh, of that spot where the surgical incision has taken place and then of course the instruments if the instruments uh, which have come out of the cssd the sterile store are you know contaminated on the way that's also a store you know, source so you know there are so many pathways it's not just one so you can imagine the plight of a hospital administrator to reduce the chances of infection so that it does not reach the wound so this is the problematic thing and we are really concerned among all these things about the operating air so this is the overall view and we are talking of the operating air so now we talk of uh, infection equation this is something that we engineers are more comfortable with talking of inve infections so now we have a concept called infectivity it is the ability of a organism to enter survive and multiply in a host that's simple to understand then infectiousness indicates ease with which the disease is transmitted to other hosts so you know covid it's a stark example it's so infectious then there are some others like covid 1 this is covid 2 covid 2 covid 1 was infectious but not as infectious so you get the idea what is infectiousness then the third item is infection occurs when there is an infectious agent in a source a susceptible host and most critically a way for the agent to be transmitted from the source to the host and this is the equation infection equal to dose into site into virulence into time divided by the level of defense of the host what is the level of defense of the host it is not just about a person with a very strong constitution the patient might be having a very strong constitution it's a great thing but there are certain operations where your defenses are made to come to almost zero so that you can accept certain type of organs that could be one reason or a particular type of uh, you know medicines otherwise your body might reject it so there are certain interventions that take place at the operation theater so that your defense mechanism has been reduced so the less the defense that you have got the more chance of infection that's on the denominator then what's the dose the more the you know virulent or pathogenic particles that get into the wound that is the dose then site is there are certain sites where the operation takes place like if it is for example the some of the worst sites would be your respiratory system anything to do with the respiratory system or open heart surgery compared to let's say you are having a operation on the leg or something like that okay then of course we talked about the virulence and last is the length of time of the operation so everything else becoming equal this length of time might make a huge difference in you know the chance of getting the infection the infection the least infections are for the uh, operations which take the shortest time and the least chance of uh, getting the lowest dose is when you have you know operations where the incisions are made the minimum so that the chance of you know particles getting into the you know surgical site is very very less so these are the things that matter 
So now we get a little bit on the concepts. Your CFU is colony forming units. And during surgery, uh, theaters have counts of 50 to 100 CFUs per meter cube for well maintained theaters, 150 to 200 for average conditions, and 400 to 500 for theaters without any air conditioning system where there is no conditioning of air with filtration and things like that. A minimum standard has been suggested in the UVC, that is the ultra clean ventilation, that the average count at the wound should not exceed 10 CFUs per meter cube. So the more the counts, the more vulnerable you become. So now we come to microorganisms that get deposited on surfaces. So viable and non-viable micro organisms which are there in the air they get ultimately deposited on surfaces so you can see that a clean surface gets quickly gets contaminated if the air is contaminated so that's what happens if you thoroughly clean the surface it reduces the uh, you know surface uh, clean i mean it makes the surface clean but again if the air is contaminated that surface does not remain clean for a very long time so you have to tackle not just cleaning of the surfaces, but also cleaning of the air. So you have to have this two pronged strategy to have a you know, very good condition inside the operation theater. So sources of microbial contamination during surgery, you've got the hands, mouth, nose, open wounds, hair and others. And then you've got this, you can see this particular operation, you've got this surgeon and this is assistant. And look at the way he has worn his, you know, uh, headgear. Uh, billions of bacteria which are on the hair and hopefully it does not have dandruff, otherwise all this is going to go into the surgical wound. And then it's there on the hand also. So this is something that you need to be aware. And these are the things that, you know, go on from their location into the wound with the air. So squams in operation theater, what are squams? Clinical trials have confirmed, basically squams are skin flakes. Clinical trials have confirmed that 80% to 90% of bacterial contaminants found in the wound after surgery come from CFU present in the air of the operation theater. Squams are primary source of transmission of bacteria transmitted to surgical site through air. Approximately 1.15 into 10 power of 6 to 0.9 into 10 power of 8 squams are generated in a typical 2 to 4 hour surgical procedure. And this is the next statement. Viral and fungal contamination also can be present on the skin scales of the you know persons in the operation theater and uh, uh, staphylococcus aureus is commonly found on the skin of many people that's how you know that's why all the nurses and surgeons have to be properly draped with very little skin exposure so that these contaminants do not come out so now we talk about uh, uh, you know correlation between particles and microorganisms in the air uh, as per NASA NHB 5340, one in 1,000 particles with sizes more than 0.5 micron or equal to or more than 0.5 micron in clean zones, 5 ISO, carries 3.5 microorganism per meter cube. There is nothing called 0.5, it's a statistical figure. So for 2 meter cube, it is 7 of air. One in 40,000 particles with sizes greater than or equal to 0.5 micron in clean room with 8 ISO carries 88 microorganisms per meter cube of air. So I would presume that you are more or less familiar which are these ISO classes. 5 ISO is class 100 which used to be called during the US FDA regime where you know uh, in a cubic foot of air it is 100 particles of 0.5 micron and above. That's what it says. And similarly, uh, I, 8 ISO is class 1 lakh. So it is 1 lakh particles in 1 cubic foot of air. So that's how you get an idea what is 8 ISO and 5 ISO. 
and for non classified uh, we call it dirty rooms they may not be that dirty but non classified rooms the number will be much much larger so this is the type of uh, you know viable counts and the uh, non viable is something which has got life and uh, non viable are particles which have got no life so when you say that 1000 particles are non viable out of that you will get something like 3.5 microorganisms per meter cube uh, of viable so that gives you an idea what we are talking of so particles and microorganisms in air why try to find correlation by virtue of trapping non viable particles viable particles to a trap especially by hepa filters actually these viable particles don't fly in the air by themselves they attach themselves to particles you know which are typically at least 10 times bigger than them so if you got a micro you know a virus of 0.12 micron it would you know latch onto a particle which is you know maybe 10 times bigger where the 10 times came comes from don't ask me i have just read it somewhere so basically what i'm trying to say is it's the bacteria and viruses they latch on to bigger particles and that's the fact of the matter and ultimately when you uh, trap the viable non viable particles let's say then the viable particles also get trapped and especially so by the hepa filters or uh, deposition of microorganisms on surfaces deposition on 1 meter square of surface per hour is estimated as suppose you got some still air how long it takes for microorganisms to get deposited on a uh, you know surface of 1 meter square so uh, per hour if we uh, we have got 80 microorganisms for class 5 iso you have got 2000 microorganism for class 8 iso for non classified of course the number will be much higher so we are talking of a 1 meter square of area which is you know could be on the operation table and we have got 80 microorganism if it was iso class 5 and 2000 in an hour if it is iso class 8 so deposition of microorganism on wounds during surgery so consider a wound which is 20 cm by 20 cm something like a 8 inch by 8 inch during a operation and uh, it could be anywhere it could be a typical uh, heart operation or something like that and uh, you got a 6 hour operation if you have that you can imagine the, i mean by that earlier formula so many square meters and deposition rate 480s microorganisms can enter this wound in a iso 8 class room and if you were doing the same operation in a iso 5 class room only 20 microorganisms would have deposited and entered the wound so you remember that first formula which i gave you know dose into uh, you know dose is you know the chance of getting the infection so we are reducing the dose in the numerator of that equation the chance of infection if you go for a laminar flow hood becomes that that much low and though this is also not a very ideal situation it shows the effect of laminar flow to improve the results of an operation now we come to uh, we talked about you know squams coming out of uh, the you know the nursing staff and the surgeons and let's learn a little more about them operating staff shed 10000 skin scales or squama per minute of these around 10% carry clusters of microorganisms that can potentially cause post operative infection <coughs> the average squama size is 7 to 20 micron normal cotton fabrics with pore sizes of 80 to 100 microns are ineffective in reducing bacterial dispersion a person dressed in a sterile scrub suit mask etc shed 140 to 830 cfu per minute just remember <coughs> you can't have a sterile scrub suit which is totally impermeable because that person will boil inside you get fried so there is a amount of permeation and because of that 
you know, along with the permeation, there is certain amount of squamous that come out of that soup. It cannot be avoided. So now we come to another very important concept. Don't get misled by all these, uh, you know, sigmas and all that. It's nothing great. <coughs> it's more to do a con with a concept. In a room with perfect turbulent mixing airflow, Cs plus Q, Cs into Q plus sigma Ci is equal to Cr into Q. So what is Cs? Concentration of microorganisms in the supply air of the HVAC system. How many CFUs per meter cube are coming in with the supply air? CR is the concentration of the microorganisms in the room air. And sigma CI is the sum of microorganism decimated into the room per unit of time. Where does this come from? From all the people who are in the room. And if there is some blood, you know, spewed all over the place, it comes from that also. So this is where the CFUs come from. And Q is the airflow rate in meter cube per minute. And CFU, of course, is the number of colony forming units. So this is the formula. It's not very difficult to understand that. Now we come to the next part, you know, just taking this equation forward for HEPA filtered supply air, you know, you are actually able to remove the uh, CS totally. That means in the supply air, there'll be zero CFUs. So this equation gets reduced to CR. That is the concentration of the Microbe, microbes in the air per meter cube become sigma ci divided by q. That is the generation of microbes divided by the quantity of air per meter uh, per unit of time that you are sending into the room. So what does that say? So if you have got a HEPA filtered air inside the uh, you know operation theater, as q increases, that means you have got more air into the system. <coughs> the CR reduces. That means the concentration of the microorganisms reduce in the operation theater. It's a very important concept. <coughs> so what does that tell you? It tells you a few things. One is, you know, you try to reduce the sigma CI, reduce the number of people inside the room. get them very well dressed so that you know very little of that whatever microorganism comes out so that and have as much of air you know circulation through hepa as possible so these are the things that can improve the outcomes of the operation only present persons present in the room will normally require to be as a consideration for dissemination of sources for microorganism now we talk of the grades of the garments, which is very important. <coughs> Normal lab and grade D. Grade D are those class one lakh type of areas. The garments, they give out 500 CFUs per minute. Uh, grade C garments, I didn't make that red now. Huh? Someone has made it. Grade C garments is 100 CFU per minute. Grade A and B garments are 25 CFU per minute. Now you look at a particular equation, CR, suppose you were to calculate that uh, there are three people uh, inside uh, operation theater. So if you got, uh, you know, uh, what shall I say, in one particular case, if you calculated that you got uh, with grade D garments, 2.5 CFA per meter cube. If you go for the same, you know, same air quantity, in that case, what will happen is, that you will have, you know, suppose you were to go for, uh, instead of grade D, you go for grade C garments, it will become one fifth of 2.5. If you go for 20, that is your grade A or B garments, this becomes one twentieth of 2.5. So the, the type of garments those people wear inside the operation theater is very important. So the better the type of garments, the less the chance of infection inside. So these are the things that count. So we talk now of the operation theaters with laminar flow, of particle counts and CFU. So the basic requirements of air cleanliness in operation theater at rest state. 
So we have got the operation theater table here and this is the surrounding air of the operation theater and zone of the operating table. We are talking of class 100 that is 5 ISO and permissible your uh, CFU per meter cube is 5 and uh, the zone around that is this part. Uh, it would be 6 ISO and the permissible CFU per yeah. Someone said something? Yes. Hello. Hello. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. 20, meter, 20 CFUs per meter cube. It is impossible to dress patients and operating personnel in clean room clothes. And so it is not possible to certify, certify contamination in, in operation conditions. We always talk of still air when we do validation. Now we come to surgery types. You know, everything is not going to be like a super uh, critical surgery. There is something called class A surgery, class B surgery, class C surgery and super speciality. So we should have a weapon which is apt for a particular type of surgery. So we are talking of classes. So class A surgery, these are, you know, minor surgical procedures performed under topical, local or regional anesthesia without pre-operative sedation. Excluded are intravenous spinal and epidural procedures, which are grade B, that is class B or class C surgeries. Then we have got class B surgeries provides minor or major surgical procedures performed in conjunction with oral, parenteral or interven uh, intravenous sedation or performed with patient under analgesic or dissociative drugs. Then we have got class C surgeries. These are major surgeries and they require regional or uh, block anesthesia or support systems for the vital bodily functions. And then we have got the NABH, which talks about super speciality, that is your uh, special, super speciality operations, which are actually not covered under A, B or C. And these are for neurosciences, orthopedics, that is your joint replacement, cardiothoracic and uh, transplant surgery, renal, liver, etc. Now we talk about what are the requirements of the various for various type of OTs. You know, the requirements as per the ASHRAE standard 170 uh, 2015, you've got the class A operation, B and C operation and C super speciality as per the NABH. So you can see that this is 21 to 24 degrees centigrade. This is gone lower 20 to 24 degrees centigrade. Then super speciality is even lower. 18 to 24 degrees centigrade. RH is 40 to 60, 20 to 60, 20 to 60. There is a more to it than this. This 20 comes basically from ASHRAE, which typically finds it more difficult to get higher RH in most of the places. But really speaking, uh, for all across the board, 40 to 60, if you don't really consider energy as a criteria, 40 to 60 is a very good criteria more about it in a different platform but let's understand that 40 to 60 percent is a very good rh to maintain across the board whether it is super speciality class a or class b or c then the pressure has to be positive then outside air three air changes four air changes four air changes uh, 15 20 20. you might be wondering why is this outside air so three four and four uh, basically what happens is that uh, apart from the fact that you would automatically require a lot of fresh air to get you the positive pressure, even otherwise you require a lot of fresh air, you know, what we call the ventilation. It's because so many chemicals are used inside the, uh, uh, in, you know, there are there is anesthesia and other chemicals which are used for cleaning the surgical instruments. And these, if the, if the contamination is not reduced, the contamination levels can go very high with your typically one air change of uh, outside air. So that's how you got these three, four and four air changes per uh, hour. 
and you got a uh, positive pressure the ashray recommends that you should have 7.5 pascals uh, we'll talk a little more about uh, what should be the pressure sub uh, in subsequent slide now we will talk about what nabh recommends for super speciality which means operation theaters as we said for neurosciences and orthopedics etc we are talking of 21 plus minus 3 20 to 60 percent outside is four pass uh, four out uh, four outside air changes and recirculation is 20 and positive pressure and uh, as i said if we are going for a super speciality especially for ortho for joints replacement the nabh is saying you have to go for 18 plus minus 3 so that's a departure from 21 you are required to maintain lower temperature Uh, general OT, they have got a concept of general OT, which means uh, for ophthalmology, district hospital OTs, FRU OTs, and other basic surgical disciplines. Here, the thing is little more. You know, they think go for twenty-one plus minus three, twenty-two. This four edge changes and twenty. And now this is the departure. NABH says the minimum should be two point five pascals. You remember we talked about seven point five pascals, which is talked of in ashray as well as the cdc but nabh for some reason is 2.5 pascals the earlier edition of nabh was saying 15 pascals for some weird reason it has been dropped to 2.5 pascals 15 was really an extreme if you really ask me 7.5 you know for all practical purposes seems to be a good standard so though it said it's minimum 2.5 i would really recommend that you Strive for 7.5, because at 2.5 you really don't know when your, uh, you know, gaskets for the door and all they become wear worn off and all that. There is a quite a possibility that you might not achieve that 2.5. Whereas with 7.5 you are on a better safe zone. So that's what it is. So uh, coming to operation theaters, there are some you know typical requirements. If it's a heart operation, you need you know low temperature, fast reheat. You know after the operation, you need a very fast reheat. So you better have those heaters in place. Then orthopedic low temperature, large room, extra filtration, cystoscopic requires medium temperature. General requires medium temperature. Pediatric is high temperature. Neurological is low temperature, large room. Then trauma is high temperature, burn is high temperature. So these are typical requirements that you know surgeons will demand. Then we come to filtration. Uh, we have got the pre-filters, the post-filters, terminal filters, then the fresh air filters and the exhaust filters. So we'll talk one by one. Uh, this is viruses is 0.01 micron to 0.05 micron. That is the typical size. Bacteria is 0.05 to 5 micron. Fungal spores and yeast cells 1 micron to 100 micron. Pollen grain 10 micron to 400. Uh, this is the important thing. Viruses and bacteria normally occur in colonies or on larger particles. Microorganisms are easily collected by filtration, but microorganisms can multiply in the filter, releasing dead or living byproduct. So this is something we should be always mindful about. It's not just enough to filter the air. You have to see what happens after that to that filter. Uh, now we are going to talk of as shown below i'm going to show that chart more 14 filters remove 75 to 85% of particles in the range of 0.3 micron to 1 micron so if you see across the board uh, the various uh, recommendations of ashray you will find that all the critical areas including your you know the operation theaters icu uh, you, you they recommend that you have a base level of more 14 because most of the particles which are viable get you know eliminated then ashray 2015 it's 170 2015 gives efficiencies of filtration together with pre filters for different areas epa filters which was earlier called mov 17 mov 17 is no longer in the ashray 52.2 it is getting covered under you know en Uh, are often specified for pee rooms bone marrow and all that and of course for 
uh, operation theaters as well. So this is the uh, 52.2 standard. You can see that more coating is somewhere here. You can see this is a very high efficiency filter. In the 0.3 to 1 micron range where most of these pathogens are, you know, it is you know 75% efficiency. And of course, this is the HEPA filter range. You know, this is what we are commonly bothered with. This is H13. Uh, you are, uh, you know, 99.95%. And in some operation theaters, they insist on 99.99% efficiency. What is this efficiency? This is the MPPS. MPPS means the most penetrating particle size. We no longer talk of 0.5 micron or 0.3 micron. What it says is the efficiency, the worst efficiency for any micro particle cannot be less than 99.95% for a H13, uh, H13 filter. See, normally for all these uh, filters, the MPPS comes to a particle of around 0.2 micron. So particles which are smaller than 0.2 micron and bigger than 0.2 micron have better efficiency than 99.95. It's something which you may not grasp straight away if you're not familiar with the filter technology, but it's something that gives you solace that because of this particular NPPS concept, though we have viruses which are, you know, 0 0.12 micron, if they are even stray, you know, in the air stream, you know, the efficiency of that is going to be greater than 99.95 because the MPPS particle is 0.2 and this particle is smaller than that. Still, it is going to be caught by 99.95% efficiency or larger. Something to think about. Hygienic criteria for filtration in HVAC systems. It is recommended to use at least two stages of filtration. One filter stage should be installed prior to cooling coil and the second uh, stage should be installed downstream of the fan. So you have, you've got, uh, you know, something which is the pre-filter out here, then you've got the cooling coil, heating coil, heaters, blower and all that. And then you've got the filter bank two, which is the fine filter. So why so? Because the contaminant from the blower section, which is subject to little more maintenance, it can be, you know, caught by the filter bank two before it goes into the room or through terminal HEPA filters. So uh, these are the minimum efficiencies for as per ASHRAE 170 2015 for grade B and C surgery, which are, you know, very high duration surgeries. We are talking of MO7 and MO14 filters, laboratories and all that, which is not the topic of today is MO13. Uh, then uh, the for super speciality operation actually recommends the use of terminal HEPA filters. Let's see what is the recommendation as per NABH. You now this is, you know, I'm quoting straight away from the super speciality recommendation of NABH. The AHU must be an air purification unit with an air filtration unit. There must be two sets of washable flange type filters, 90% down to 10 micron and 99% down to 5 micron with aluminum stroke SS304 frame within the AHU. The necessary service panel to be provided for serving the filters and motors and blowers. HEPA filters of efficiency 99.97% down to 0.3 micron or higher efficiency are to be provided. That's what it says for the super speciality. In general, OTs, they are not talking of HEPA being a requirement. They say that two levels of filtration are good enough. In addition, we are talking of hygienic criteria for filtration in HVAC systems. It is for the, you know, for the outdoor air, we, they talk of MOL 13 because that's where, you know, a lot of contaminants can come inside and exhaust air, uh, MOL 10. And very important that, uh, you know, apart from these considerations, you have to take into account that when you're inducting fresh air into, you know, critical area like uh, operation theater, you should be sure that it is not coming from a contaminated, uh, contaminated place. What are the contaminated places? It could be exhausts of, you know, some automobiles which are nearby, or it could be from a chimney, 
or it could be from you know uh, uh, near from near a cooling tower or you know where the chance of legionnaire's disease is there so we have to be very clear that the fresh air intake has to be from a clean place we have to make sure the second thing is exhaust air has to be protected for contaminant by at least more than grade filters again you have to ensure that when you are exhausting air you are not exhausting into a fresh air intake of another area so be mindful of these kind of things then we talk of operation theater types earlier we talked about the operation types now we are talking of the operation theater types you got the multi array diffusers then you got the air curtain type laminar which is not very popular in india but i'm putting it because uh, for a uh, for a purpose of com completeness then you got the single laminar diffuser which is you know the first one multi array diffuser and the last one single laminar diffuser are the ones which are quite common so in operation theater we are talking of a air pattern the strategy adopted in ot air distribution is to sweep away the contaminants released from the wound and from the surgical stream uh, is swept away to the return air risers so you can see this particular thing you know you know if you have generated those black things as contaminants you should be able to sweep it away from the wound that is the crux of the thing you know we talked of you know uh, you know a, a, something like a, a five hour surgery giving you 20 microorganisms uh, of deposition that five you know those 20 microorganisms also should be our goal should be to sweep it out you know don't allow it to come to the surgical wound at all so that 20 just becomes a number as far as you are concerned you are keeping the surgical wound very safe that's the whole idea so we talk now of a particular experiment that was done by you know a guy called um, memar zade farad memar zade he is a guy a dude who is commonly quoted by ashray for the work that he has done in uh, you know this particular uh, field he has not only done work in this he has done lot of work in uvgi and all that so this guy did this particular study and uh, you can see what we have here is a uh, you know actual operation theater that has been you know uh, created as a model for study and you got this bed and these are the you know mannequins who are standing below a laminar flow system and these mannequins are generating microbes out of their hands and from their you know uh, from their nose and things like that and you got these mannequins were heated to uh, you know 100 watts so that uh, they mimic a human being having something like 37 degrees centigrade so all the convection currents that are associated with the uh, actual human beings uh, have been replicated in this study so what you see here is that all these microbes are you know swept away rather than going on to the operation theater bed so this is what we require in a operation theater you should sweep it away from the ot that should be the cleanest place you know after that it can be 5 cfu per meter cube out here but here you try to get it to zero that's the whole idea so we have got uh, you know we talked about the multiple uh, diffuser array it is normally either like this or this is spread over you know bigger space and you got the ot table out here um, so you got the laminar dif uh, diffuser over the table and let's say you got the total multi uh, diffuser array which is 57 square feet 7 feet by 8 feet cube very common then you got uh, you know this curtain type which is you know which was at one time very popularly advocated by ashray uh, there is a air curtain type of effect out here you can see this and the air goes out here the contaminant area is you know all this turbulent air is protected from uh, you know kept away from the ot 
and the air from this laminar diffuser is protecting the patient so that's the concept we'll talk more about it so this is that uh, you know slot type of diffuser on the perimeter and then we have got uh, you know this uh, sld1 and 2 uh, sld1 is the slightly smaller one with 7 feet by 8 feet uh, you know laminar flow uh, typically where you got a surgeon and two assistants working that's the size that uh, you can typically expect and then we have got sld2 you know big cardio operations or operations for orthopedics with some 10 people you may require this kind of it can go even higher than this but i am talking about sld2 till now and uh, we'll now talk of you know uh, you know what happens you know what type of air quantities we are going to look at for the various type of uh, you know diffuser arrangements so you got uh, you know the air velocity comparison at 30 fpm and this is air velocity at 50 fpm this is not a feasible thing here so it's excluded so uh, when you are dealing with air curtain type that you know ashray type which i said air curtain then multi diffuser type you should remember what i said then sld1 is the smaller laminar flow and this is sld2 bigger laminar flow here we are talking of two typical these are typical air quantities 576 cfm 1700 cfm 1700 cfm or 2500 cfm and uh, this is at 30 fpm at 50 fpm it is more to 82828284270 so what happens is you know the air quantities go more why are we talking of 50 you know the earlier very interestingly nabh used to say we want 50 fpm those from the older stock will remember that that uh, this used to be a figure like 90 to 50 fpm so earlier we had to design uh, laminar flows at 100 fpm and then the surgeons would say that now you reduce that air velocity we don't want it at 100 fpm why because the wounds are getting dried very fast you know so it's uh, uh, it's something that goes against the operations so really speaking you should not really go above 50 fpm or even 60 fpm not much beyond that so 30 fpm is what we are talking of and 50 fpm this chart is basically in terms of air quantity and what type of kilowatts of, of power that you need for each one of those types and uh, here we talk of uh, the total cfu per meter cube you can see that uh, you know the laminar flow with that uh, you know that uh, air curtain effect is going to give you you know 80 plus microorganisms per uh, meter cube and uh, we are talking of in this uh, multi diffuser array it goes down to something like 24 meter 24 cfu per meter cube at 30 and 11 uh, cfu per meter cube at 50 fpm then sld1 goes to you know 2 at 30 fpm zero at 50 fpm sld2 is at 30 fpm zero 50 fpm it's zero so sld2 is for the bigger size than the very critical operations sld1 is you know also for critical but requiring less number of people inside the operation theater so this you get, get a general idea of what i'm talking about so this is what i explained and just remember these were the figures uh, coming out of the standard there the maximum uh, acceptable is 5 cfu i'm talking of basically of aseptic type of operations it's not applicable for class a and b type of operations so that's what it is so just to summarize that you got uh, you know the input power which goes right up to 7.11 as against sld1 which can do also a fairly good job you can see the ultimately this is the proof of the pudding you know what are the microbes that come out this is more than meeting the standard sld1 onwards so now we come to a little more detail air flow in a single direction uh, through a clean air device or a clean zone with essentially parallel streams this is what is called the unidirectional 
airflow. Earlier, it used to be called laminar airflow. Airflow characterized by a deviation of not more than 14 degrees from the straight line flow through the work zone. Then measured using relative standard deviation of air velocity normal to the plane of airflow RSD is equal to, that is the standard deviation, uh, standard deviation by average is into 100. It should not be more than 15% to be classified as a unidirectional airflow. Then the reference document is uh, ISO 14644-3 airflow pattern in which point-to-point uh, -point readings of velocities are within a specified percentage of the airflow. You cannot have too much variation at the various zones inside the laminar you know, unidirectional flow. If you have that, you will create some eddies inside. That's why you've got a limit of plus minus 10% uh, you know, in the velocity. For NABH, the recommended, uh, velo uh, the recommended uh, velocities are 25 to uh, your 35 FPM at the supplier grill. And uh, uh, as per ASHRAE 170 2017, again it's 25 to 35. Remember earlier NABH was talking of 90 to 100. Then uh, NABH 2015 return air point should be at a level of 75 to 150 mm from the floor level. Ideally, at least four level, no level return to be provided at the four corners of the operation theater. Additional return air points near the wall with low exit velocity helps to reduce the stratification of air. You, it's not just about putting the you know return air risers of here. You should have a certain amount of suction here so that you should avoid the, you know, uh, any spaces in the operation theater where there is uh, still air. So when you have a return air point there, you find that, you know, there is no stratification. Now we talk about uh, room pressure gradient. Why pressurization? Of course, uh, most of us understand this, but for uh, sake of completeness, I'm telling when a patient has to be protected from airborne contamination coming in from adjoining spaces, the room is kept at a higher pressure, that is positive pressure. So the room air exfiltrates from the room into the less clean area. And uh, vice versa, when the adjoining spaces need to be protected from potent drugs like your nuclear medicine or from patients with airborne infectious disease, as is happening today in COVID times, the room has to be contained. So the room is under negative pressure compared to outside. So the air can come in, not the other way around. Now, this is a very nice concept that you have to understand. So what in effect it is saying is that, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, a clean room and you've got a, you know, less clean room outside, what is, the amount of, you know, those particles from outside that are going to come in at various pressures. See, the room door is closed, but still certain particles will migrate from the outside into the inside. So we are plotting here when the differential pressure is minus 10 right up to 20. And you remember we are talking of 2.5 in NABH and 7.5 in you know, ASHRAE standard 170 or CDC. So what happens is if you are looking at, let's say 0.5 micron particles, this is for 0.5 micron particles at zero pressure and the doors are closed till there is something which is coming in from outside 0.01%. When you are talking of super clean area, it is 0.01% of what? of the outside air. Is it something you can afford? You can't. So this is something that you have to be aware of. You know, what it says is even at five pascals, even at 10 pascals, still there is a migration of particles from outside into the inside, even if you've got positive pressure. Why is it so? 
it is because of certain concepts of brownian motions those who are mechanical engineers among the audience will easily understand or physics people will also understand there is something called brownian motion that takes place and there is a you know uh, dispersion of particles depending on the concentration of particles the concentration of particles in a clean cleaner zone is less in the less clean zone is more so because of this this the particles are in spite of the pressure they are also moving inside so what does that really tell us number one that uh, you know if as against uh, zero uh, from zero to you know five pascals there is a uh, 40% reduction in migration that's very important so you need that positive pressure and if the adjoining room is much dirtier so that 0.01% 0.0% of a huge uh, dirty concentration is going to come in so that tells you that the adjoining room should be uh, also quite clean so this is what again happens when the door is opened and there is a migration of particles so what it says is we come to a concept of what is called the uh, what contamination ratio that means uh, 5% of the outside contaminants will find their way from the outside to inside at 0 pascals this reduces to 1% at 15 pascals 4% at 5 pascals 2% at 10 pascals so basically this is going to happen because of the nature of you know the particles and it's you know you might say why not go for 15 pascals when it is 1% 15 pascals is going to be very irritating why because if you go for 15 pascals it is going to create a lot of sound and this is a you know operation theater not a pharma factory so this kind of sound may not be acceptable you you know if you have air which is whizzing through you know a small gap in a operation theater door you don't want it to make noise so you know at 7.5 or 2.5 pascals you know it's barely audible at 15 pascals it's quite audible so the trick is that you will have to understand that that whatever 3% or 4% that is the contamination ratio should be from a area which is adjacent which is not very dirty it should be relatively quite clean so the operation theater should open into a clean corridor you can't have it open into a toilet just to exaggerate you have to open into a clean corridor which should also have hepa filters may not be grade 5 it can be grade 8 but it has to be clean so that's the play, point i'm making pressure differential cleanliness class difference is very important between the adjoining areas and the leakage area has to be small so that's a point that i've made now we go to age cooling coil designs to obtain the rh so this is for the hardcore hvac engineers and we say that uh, you know we want temperatures which are going to be uh, you know as low as 18 or you know sometimes the surgeons even talk of 16% if there is a amenable air conditioning engineer around but uh, you just imagine we are talking of low temperature and still maintaining a range of 20 to 60% and right up to something like 24 degrees centigrade and still maintaining that 20 to 60% so what is being you know uh, projected here so, you know the various uh, things which are talking of if we maintain this particular dew point of the air that is coming out of the uh, you know h u cooling coil then you can address most of all these conditions that you require in this zone you know you have to have this air at 46 degrees fahrenheit to achieve the entire unless you are quite sure your operation theater is not meant for you know low temperatures at all you can afford to make this 46 as 48 or 49 but if you want a operation theaters to cater to the entire range of operations that air has to be at 46 degrees fahrenheit with very 
very low temperature so now i'm just talking of this when supply air is at 45 degrees dew point it is considered to be a sweet spot that means you can cater to anything that the surgeon wants at this condition almost all the commonly requested combinations of temperature and humidity can be maintained surgeon should be allowed to set only the dry bulb and not the rh this is something that i have learned over the years and so have many of my colleagues from the hvacr industry give them a you know something for uh, you know setting the temperature but not the rh rh should be through you know the secondary controls now the effect of chilled water flow on leaving air temperature so you know you will have to design for uh, you know the flow through your uh, tubes at a high velocity to reach at 45 degree outlet so not the chilled water entering temperature we have considered to be 4.4 degree centigrade now it's a different matter whether you would like to give 4.5 4 through chilled water system at the cooling coil that means it might be leaving the best of times at 4 degree center centigrade from the chiller which is a tall order so many of the operation theaters are based on a primary coil uh, which is maybe 8 degree centigrade or 10 degree centigrade then you might be having a dx system to get to the required dew point that's the way most operation theaters are designed but to some bigger hospitals having 10 ot's or you know something like that they can talk in terms of a dedicated chiller for the operation theaters and they can avoid all the headache of having uh, you know uh, dx plants by generating chilled water at 4 degree centigrade and have good insulation so that you are talking of 4.4 degree centigrade at the cooling coil and achieve you know what the surgeon wants for any known operation so that's a very important point then the effect of air velocity on leaving air temperature at 400 fpm uh, if you are talking of uh, you can achieve 45 degrees fahrenheit you know as uh, this is a theoretical chart basically beyond 500 we don't talk of you can talk of if you got those dedicated fresh air systems where the coil is dry uh, the recirculatory coil is dry but we really talk of here so here as i said we should be designing at 400 fpm and those velocities in order to design a coil properly you may not get the selections otherwise then a uh, chilled water coil design to maximize the coil performance to obtain low supplier dew point with available chilled water deeper rows are preferred for increasing the heat transfer radius straight fins and generally 10 fins per inch is found to be better for maintenance and coil cleaning and uh, typically uh, when more than 6 rows of cooling coils are involved it is recommended that you should split it into two and with a gap in, in between for proper uh, inspection door for cleaning now we come to something really really important where you know uh, there is this tendency to oversize things and it results in something quite obnoxious chilled water flow will have to be throttled to achieve the designed temperature so what happens is if you have overestimated the heat load and that heat load does not exist so what happens the air quantity is fixed so the supplier temperature will have to be more and more so instead of you know coming out at you know whatever this temperature was you may come out at this temperature or you may come out at this temperature to maintain that you know inside temperature so just imagine that if your air is going to be cooled only till here because temperature is something that the surgeon understands so what will happen the chilled water i mean the air leaving air temperature will have to be increased so that you get the room temperature so the dehumidification is going to be much much lower the rh is going to shoot up so the typical thing that happens when you have a oversized coil is that you are going to have high rh do what you may you may end up you know heating like anything with heaters that's a very poor design when air leaving temperature increases it may exceed the room dew point and the rh cannot be maintained the only way out becomes huge amount of heat to 
offset the absent equipment load oversize coils lead to higher rh be aware of this implications of overestimating heat load for dxhu in dxhu's oversized cooling coil plus dx unit quickly achieves the room temperatures and then it cycles off same problem when condensing unit cycles off dehumidification stops and the rh shoots up condensing unit restarts at higher Uh, room temperature so it's all mismatch when you do over estimation so ideally what we have found to be very useful is you know estimate the heat load properly and then go for multiple dx compressors if you have to put any so if you got to put let's say uh, 8 tons of dx then you you know divide it into two or four tons or better still three or four three tons something like that you know you'll Uh, you will reduce this on off on off you know very often and uh, another reason for high humidity is because condensate re evaporates when the compressor stops so when the compressor stops the fins which have got the you know dew on them they starts evaporating and uh, during the off cycle of the compressor again the you know rh shoots up so this is something due to the hunting of compressors so you can see from this chart short run times remove heat but not moisture so if you oversized the uh, you know oversized the uh, system that is compressor as well as the cooling coil you will find that you know the uh, uh, the time of run time uh, of the uh, compressor is getting reduced and the removal of the moisture is getting reduced So we talk of air flow schematics for operation theaters, the normal operation, and something for the COVID times. So this is what the operation theater uh, H would look like. You got the MAU seven filter, MAU fourteen filter. Then the supply goes into the laminar flow or plenum. It could be H thirteen or H fourteen. Yeah. Someone telling something? Okay. Uh. so this is at positive pressure then you got the clean corridor or air lock it exfiltrates into this and then into the outside general area and uh, some of these systems might be having this defogging arrangement then you know either at the end of the day or maybe once a week that particular uh, hospital administration might have scheduled a defogging i'm not talking of fumigation it's defogging fogging you fog for some time and then get the fog out so this is how the normal schematic for a operation theater would be double positive positive and zero and in covid times what we want is that this air should not go out but outside air is very dirty you don't want to come in so this air lock is maintained at negative pressure using you know this exhaust through a hepa and uh, why hepa because this air which is coming out into the air lock could be quite contaminated and you don't want it to go just into the atmosphere uh, you know it, typically h13 hepa is given out here then we have talked of uh, so many things about uh, your uh, you know operation theaters and things like that how uh, you know how clean things have to be but the other side of the story which does not really catch the eye is the maintenance so the operation theater is going to be only as clean as how you maintain you know the other components of the hvac system so we have got maintenance issues related to cleaning of hus ducts and filters maintenance issues related to the hepa filters so now we talk a little bit about it why do we need to clean ducts because the, the ducts even in hepa you know with that hepa filter because of the you know the type of clothes that uh, people wear inside you know there can be uh, quite a lot of uh, these uh, especially it comes from you know fibers they get deposited over time inside the return areas so uh, these become sources of accumulation of dust and fungus so you should do the duct cleaning and i have shown what it looks before and after and uh, the filters we are talking of filters uh, mau 14 and all that and suppose you have a air bypass you know the whole uh, 
the whole purpose of that filter is defeated example of filter bank with downstream servicing and badly assembled filter which could not withstand the operating pressure you know it's so choked that it came out of that place so then it starts bypassing then this is also a not a very uncommon site you got a, you know uh, you got a fantastic laminar flow down there and this is what is happening in the hu you got a choked condensate uh, drain fresh air ducts with dead pigeons feathers pollen so if you think that i am showing something which is out of the blue and it's not so uh, there was a particular incident which was uh, not too far into history where you know you might have heard of km hospital in mumbai it is one of the best equipped civic hospitals in mumbai and it has got a uh, you know it had this uh, orthopedic uh, uh, operation theater and uh, you know on a thursday they found that maggots were coming down the you know the fall ceiling maggots in a you know hepa filter area they were finding maggots coming out of the fall ceiling and then that was that happened on a thursday and they they checked where these are coming from and they found that dead pigeons are there in the fresh air duct and uh, that had led to lot of infestation and that's how the maggot growth was there and uh, after that they had a prefunctory cleaning of that whole operation theater and by sunday it was business as usual and uh, this news leaked in the newspapers and then there was hue and cry and of course you know uh, after that uh, hue and cry you know people were pulled up and things like that but recently at covid times had the opportunity of going to km hospital myself and i found that it had re relapsed into their old methods of bad housekeeping so this is and this is very very potent you know you cannot have maggots inside the fresh air duct Uh, issues related to laminar flow plenum filters damaged filters improper filter installation and dop stroke pao test ignored so uh, you don't want that to happen right so you just imagine that you got a pin prick hole and you are doing a cardiac operation and that pin prick hole is above the surgical site the pathogens that come out from the pin prick hole are going to be like a ak47 bullets which are going to come into that wound so that's not what you want to happen and you cannot ignore it it's not about average filtration it is the critical site that might get affected so be aware of that so the other issue is static charge build up on synthetic diffusers this is another thing that has become quite popular but i don't support this kind of synthetic diffuser screens they look good but they have got some issues leading to contamination build up and air leakage through the surgical uh, chute you know this is the chute that might have a air leakage so these are vulnerable things that have to be validated properly then air flow schematic sorry uh, validation of operation theaters the nabh that is the national accreditation board which i talked about uh, it says that you have to test as per the iso 14644 for the following parameters temperature and relative humidity air particulate count air change rate calculation air velocity pressure differential and hepa uh, integrity challenge test and validations have to be carried out at least once in 6 months the following tests can also be con uh, conducted that is air flow direction and air visualization test and recovery test air fresh air changes test now we talk of air velocity test in uh, you know in case of diffusers you have to use flow hood in case of filters as in laminar flow you use anemometer number of measuring points should be square root of 10 times the filter area in square meter or 4 whichever is whichever is larger that's what the iso says measurement to be made 150 mm to 300 mm from the filter face 
temperature which you normally do along with the RH. This is uh, to be carried out only after one hour of area being stabilized. Thermometers, RTDs, thermistors compliant with the ISO 7726. You cannot bring in just something bought out of Amazon. You have to have compliant to ISO 7726. You have to give the calibration certificate. Measurement interval, not more than five minutes. Reading should be at work level height, not less than 300 mm from, not less than, yeah, not less than 300 mm from floor, ceilings or walls. Then temperature measurement to be taken at minimum two points with zones divided into equal areas. That means if you are taking four zones, you create four equal areas and take four points. And then we are talking of humidity arrangement uh, measurement. You've got acceptable instrument. Sling psychrometer is one of the best. I can swear by them if they they are calibrated or meters with dielectric thin film capacitor or dew point sensor. Uh, in instrument should be compliant with ISO 7726 measurement interval not more than five minutes. Again, uh, you know at work height level. Uh, less than 500 meter, more than 500, 300 mm above the uh, floor or from the sides of the walls. Room to be decided in equal areas uh, of zones, not less than two areas should be there, means two points you take and so on. And then room differential pressure, room pressure differential has to be measured with respect to adjoining rooms and the ambient. Electronic or mechanical manometers can be used measuring range is 0 to 100 or 0 to 50. Remember you are measuring 2.5 pascals. It's not a joke. Mem resolution to be minimum one pascal accuracy to be not less than 1.5% of mechanicals of the full scale for electronic or 5% of the full scale for the mechanical gauge. And then you've got filter and integrity installation integrity testing. And uh, here you use two pieces of equipment. That is your aerosol challenge generator. Um, and then you've got the mass photometer. This is the challenge generator with aerosol, you know, Laskin nozzles, uh, which create that aerosol. Uh, it can be your uh, PAO, that is your poly alpha olefin or DOP, that is dioctyl phthalate. Uh, it is discouraged, you know, the DOP is discouraged. You're supposed to go for poly alpha olefin because it is not cancerous like DOP. And this is the mass photometer with the scanning probe. So we'll talk a little bit about it. So the filter and installation integrity testing, I explained to you why it is important to check all that because that minor leak can cause a problem for you. The concentration of the aerosol challenge upstream of the filter should range from one meter milligram per meter cube to 100 milligram per meter cube. The strange thing is many of the operation theaters you will find there is no port on the upstream to see what is the mass concentration. People are doing the test only checking what is the downstream. It's a really, it, you know, it baffles me how uh, you know, people can do these things as engineers without doing setting your zero uh, hundred percent with the upstream. You're just measuring the downstream. And if you see there is no upstream port that has been provided by our fellow HVAC engineers, sad to say. It is desirable to choose a probe which has a rectangular inlet of one centimeter or eight WP eight centimeter or a circular probe of 3.6 centimeter all that it's there in the eye so you don't need to uh, you know really depend on this then the probe traverse scan rate has to be five centimeter you can't have you know someone in a hurry doing your scan test you'll get wrong results a lead detected in excess of 0.01 percent of the upstream mass concentration is deemed to be exceeding the maximum allowable for uh, penetration however for filter systems having an integral MPPS of greater than 99, uh, sorry, uh, something wrong with this statement. 0 0.01 is for up to 99.95% and for less than 99.995%, it is 0.1% as against 0.01%. 
then we are talking of the uh, particle counting that is uh, lsapc it is called light scattering airborne particle counter has to be used it should be having a valid certification cert calibration certificate as per iso 21501-4 sampling locations are determined as per you know uh, iso 14644-2019 that's the latest select particle size for validation 0.5 and 5 micron determine the sampling volume then sampling velocity not to be more than uh, 20% in any location i talked about it uh, then transit tube uh, length to be as small as possible you cannot have a long tube for the sampler it gives wrong readings then limits on the particulates as per iso 14644-1 is like this. We talked of uh, class 5. So if you see uh, 0.5 micron is what you measure. That is to be per meter cube 3520 and 5 micron should be 0 at the laminar, I mean, at the OT table. And uh, the adjoining might be class 6 and there it can be 35200 and you are allowed 293 per meter cube and number of sampling locations. So if you see the uh, uh, laminar flow table, the table, theoretically you can measure only one because the table is quite small. But what is in practice done is two to three. This is the minimum locations, right? So two to three is what is practically done uh, for the operation tables. And the adjoining areas, which uh, you know, a typical operation theater might be for 40 square meters so you need to go for something like 10 number of sampling readings and then we talk of uh, you know the sampling volume again quoted from uh, uh, iso uh, and what in substance it says is at least one minute has to be spent at each location and uh, go through this calculation on your own what it says is that you uh, if you take a one CFM air sampling, it comes to one minute. If you have a sampling which is much lower than that, the sampling time will have to get extended. So that's what it means. Sorry. That's what it means. So with that, I will come to the end of the validation part also. So that's the end of my presentation, which was you know, relatively long. And supposing that you're also quite fatigued. No Thank you. Sir, no over, to, no, over to you, uh, Somyo. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's uh, we are not fatigued at all. It's a <laughs> pleasure to have you because in our chapter and thanks to our online system of having webinars, we are fortunate enough to have you at our miss. So uh, there's some questions. Uh, I believe I think we should be coming up with. So could yeah. I share with you the questions, please? Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is a question uh, from Mr. Manish Tibrival from Guwahati. Uh, he asked me, he asked us, is the phase velocity of laminar flow panels as given in the NAVH guidelines, is it sufficient? That's um, question number one. No, and, uh, can you just repeat that? I'm not too sure I've understood the question. The question is, is the phase velocity of the laminar flow panels as given in the NABH guidelines sufficient? You want me to answer that first? Yeah. Uh, it is in fact sufficient. You know, it's not a very good idea to have very high velocities. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two things that are required that of course that it has to be laminar. It's not ending with that. Uh, you know, it's not just saying that the velocity has to be so much. The, you know, there has to be a laminar flow. So basically what it says is you have got this 30 or 35 FPM that is coming out. And if it's laminar flow, that's what it is at the operation theater bed. If it is in fact laminar flow. If it's not, it dissipates and that 35 goes much lower. So basically, the crux of the design is the perforation. You know, the perforation 
it's not just about any guy deciding what perforation to have it's a design engineering component where reynolds number gets into picture the velocity this is the average velocity across the lamina right but if you see the velocity at which it is actually coming out it's higher and that's determined by that reynolds number so that the lamina remains lamina through the traverse right till the operation theater bed so to answer that question 35 is good enough but your laminar perforations have to be designed right okay uh second question is from the same person is saying how to what is the method to do particular particulate count in an ot method to do particulate count is i've explained that you got a particle meter and you have to keep it on the ot you know on the ot table and take the measurements you know two spots minimum is what we do three is what is more likely that's what we do for on the ot bed itself and the adjoining area we take up to you know as it went by that iso uh, chart it comes to about uh, i think i said something like 6 uh, or 6 uh, or i don't recollect the figure 6 or 10 Uh, ten, uh, ten spots at which you have to take, and as if you have got a one cfm meter, if you understand the sampling, uh, uh, sampling that is done by the, uh, you know the particle counter. If you have got one cfm, you have to do it for one minute. That should be good enough to meet the requirements of the, uh, you know, ISO one four six four four. Right, sir. Uh, then there is another question from Mr. Devabrata Das. What are the additional features to be considered in view of COVID? Uh, the biggest feature is going to be that uh, you know you should be able to have that uh, ante room, which is as I showed at negative pressure, uh, because you don't want uh, the inside air to go into the general area. So the ante room is kept at negative pressure. You you know there are some people who are doing the shortcut of keeping the ot itself at negative pressure which is a very wrong thing because the ot is basically a concept in terms of aseptic so as the operation has to be aseptic and if you are doing a aseptic operation under negative pressure that means all the adjoining dirty air is going to get into your operation theater you don't want that to happen so that ante room is what has to be kept at a negative pressure that's the thing you have to you know do and uh, you know as far as uh, as hvc engineers that's what we do and the other features are going to be like you know room sterilization using your you know maybe uh, uv lights and things like that you know these are the additional things that the administration may want to do uh, you know, when the you know after operation you may want to sanitize the room uh, in a particular way and there are so many methods of sanitization not just with uv but also with the you know some fogging and all that that's really uh, nothing to do with the hvc engineer the way hvc engineer is going to do is deform that area after the fogging process right sir uh, there's a question from uh, one of the participants uh, in between all the thank yous which are there with <laughs> in the in the chat box uh, what are the what are the techniques of duct cleaning so techniques of duct cleaning the only thing which is uh, really you know the one which i know is the one which is done by robo i can't think of anyone trying to do enter the duct and clean it because it's a dangerous place to even go even if it was a big duct you have to have those robots which are now available so basically you send in the robo we have actually done in several of the operation theaters because what happens you know whether you like it or not uh, the return air duct is the most vulnerable you know you have got the filter and then what happens many a times is that you have got the return air filter and uh, sometimes they just remove that filter and uh, that is you know behind some equipment and nobody knows i'm talking of a real life scenario and all these you know fibers go into the return air hepa is always going to protect you but then you got lot of these fibers in the return air and those become accumulation for fungus and 
you know in one particular case they uh, they actually found something called the microcoki in a very good hospital microcoki comes from animals how it came there they themselves have not understood but it came there so it could be like you know the uh, the clothes that they wear you know they got contaminated and that found in the uh, air stream and you know over the years it has developed but microcoki was found there right sir uh, one the question from mr samir shivastar is saying first of all thank you to you <laughs> for the presentation good old friend of mine <laughs> yeah <laughs> the question is uh, scavenging equipment plays an important role but impacts the iaq in the ot does it also affect the recovery time uh, i'm not too sure what do you mean by scavenging equipment scavenging, yeah. scavenging is your the re air recirculation is that what you mean samir i'm not too sure uh, see basically if you're talking of iaq it's a very valid statement and we have talked of four air changes as against normally one and that's because of the iaq concerns because there is lot of uh, you know typically if you see this surgical instruments when you do the cold sterilization they use uh, glutaraldehydes you know these are quite uh, you know toxic chemicals and you cannot have those uh, you know fume levels going up glutaraldehyde is a common especially if you are doing this endoscopic operations you will find these kind of you know chemicals inside and that's why you have to go for four air changes of fresh air to keep the you know iaq in control i hope that answers samir's question i believe so sir uh, there is one more question from mr aditya oh uh, one second uh, i'll just go to the question there so many thank yous in between <laughs> so yeah thank yous are welcome <laughs> <laughs> so how to calculate the heat load for ot Now, do we follow the same procedure as per E twenty form? Oh, uh, see, uh, of course it will be E twenty. But if you are actually doing, uh, you know, uh, if you are doing, you are going to do temp, uh, heat load at eighteen degrees centigrade. There is something in E twenty which is missing, and that part is your, you know, uh, permeation load. If you see, all our calculations are ignoring the permeation load. you know permeation can be quite a load so uh, e20 gives you a fairly good estimate except for the permeation load let's put it like that so you can add those permeation uh, you know uh, things into that e20 and make it a, that's what i do uh, how do you do that basically if you read uh, munter's handbook or uh, briar handbook they have given the calculations for permeation load Uh, at the low temperatures and low rh or uh, how much it is so it's a very useful uh, thing that you can adopt for you know as a small addition to your e20 and uh, the other precaution you have to take is that uh, you know the uh, blower load is very significant you know what we take 7 and a half percent in the e20 it doesn't work for operation theaters Uh, the blower load because of the six-inch static blower and all that is going to be a very significant load. So if you have ignored that load, again you are in trouble. You won't get that temperature. So these are the two things you have to incorporate. Okay, the same person has asked another question. So what is the function of heaters in the OTHU? See, basically, as I said, you have to get down to the sweet point. That is your, you know, that forty-five degrees ADP. Uh, dew point, not ADP. Dew point. Let's say for a very low temperature OT, but if it is for a higher temperature, it might be 48. But be whatever it is. Now you design it for that. But then what happens is there are certain seasons when the moisture load is more. Sometimes it is less. So you have got the dew point, but then you have to still attain the temperature. So what happens is there are times when the load is going to be less. and otherwise the temperate to achieve that adp you cool that quite a lot but the load in the room is less remember that oversized coil what i was talking of you have to heat it up so that heat is required invariably to achieve the conditions of you know 16 degree centi 18 degree centigrade and say 55% rh without that heater you may find it impossible to achieve these conditions you know 
uh, you will have to devise ways in which this reheat can be you know uh, complemented suppose you are going to have this dx systems for example it's very easy to do it the hot gas can be used for reheat uh, very effectively and uh, you know at low temperatures for for example uh, cardiac uh, operations it comes to almost 16 kilowatts of reheat so if you use this kind of reheat system using your condensing heat you will find that with just uh, you know correctional heaters of 2 3 kilowatts you know with thyristor drive you can easily do without any additional heating right sir so uh, the some more questions uh, nabh has asked for positive pressure in ot round the clock yes now uh, please suggest the best possible practical way for 24 by 7 positive pressure which includes energy saving <laughs> okay i will tell you of a very uh, it's a by the way uh, it's a by the way don't get me wrong it's a by the way out of syllabus we, we, <laughs> i was talking to energy savings to a surgeon of all persons okay and i told uh, this is required that is required and all that and then he told me how much is it going to save per operation i did some quick calculation with my calculator and i said that per operation you will save 200 bucks then he said that i earn 1 lakh per operation i don't care about this complicated systems you give me the rh and temperature that i want leave that aside i have just that was a aside okay but still it's a very important point because uh, as a natural resource we cannot be wasteful we cannot be profligate to so to speak so you know what is done is that the hvac system should never stop that's a most important point the positive pressure has to be always maintained okay otherwise the outside uh, contaminants will rush inside and uh, all that sterile aseptic atmosphere will get destroyed so what is done for energy conservation is that you raise the temperature during the idling periods you know from 24 degrees centigrade you raise it to something like 30 degrees centigrade and also the recirculation is kept at a bare minimum you know let's say if you are operating at 50 hertz that uh, you know the blower you take it down to something like 25 hertz you know or whatever is the minimum but at the same time ensure that you are not gone below that 2.5 pascals that is recommended you know that's a validation you do for idle operation with that you get phenomenal savings in energy you do your calculations you will be really wondering why you didn't do it because uh, the fan itself is so much going to reduce the energy uh, you go by the cube law no in fan you know uh, if it is uh, 100 it becomes let's say 50.5 into 0.5 into 0.5 you do the math you know that what is the running kilowatts during the idling period so the fan load goes on because the temperature is 30 degree you save on the cooling energy so on and so forth you know it's a lot of advantages but don't ever stop the hvc system because another thing forget about the pathogens coming in there is going to be moisture coming in you know and you get fungus inside and that is really terrible yeah correct correct now there are some two questions which are very similar to each other is asking about inverter compressors uh, should we uh, use inverter compressor rather than splitting into many outdoor units or inverter based dx system you know see uh, you could use them but the basic thing is uh, i have never used them because it puts lot of constraints on my way of designing my systems and the inverter guy says you can't go below this you can't below that and i don't know what to do after that so it's not that you can't do it but uh, you know you consult with that inverter guy and the guys i am talking to they have not been able to answer me how to do with the vrf how to get that adp of 45 and all that they say 50 is the limit and things like that the guys whom i have talked to maybe i am talking to the wrong guys but all the guys that i have talked to have not been able to give me adp of 45 and things like that you know right sir so one question which is common to each and every participant and if i just open up the unmute button the everybody will ask me the same question how can we get your presentation <laughs> i'll give you see the the fact is 
I am not the creator of the presentation. It is the World Wide Web and the Google Guru. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so you can send me on that mail. I have shared. I'll, I'll I'll share it with you, and you can you know share yeah. it with all the people. I have shared we my. Want, uh, we want to more safe hospitals. Let me put it like that. Definitely, definitely, <laughs> sir. And I have put across my mail address for everyone in the chat box so that they can check it out. Call, send me the messages. And I'll also share with all the participants that this has been recorded. This uh, presentation, this webinar, it will be on our Ishtar Kolkata YouTube channel. And there are some more questions, sir. So we're not going to leave you so early. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought two hours was the limit. <laughs> yeah, I'll just there's about two minutes left, so I'll just take out okay. this took one question: How okay. to avoid contamination from medical air used for pneumatic tools? Okay, it's really, really a very, very good question. You know, the pneumatic tools, if they are used for basically your uh, orthopedic operation, where you start cutting your bones and things like that. they are responsible for what is called that ultimately you can trace it to mrsa you might have heard of mrsa and mrsa is a dangerous thing to have because there are very few known medicines which can really help you once you contract that disease and it can be a uh, what shall i say a very uh, it is a what shall i say very dangerous thing for anyone to have you know Uh, hospital administrators are shuddering at the chance of mrsa you know infecting uh, any of the patients so uh, so basically it's really a important question so basically it it all boils down to having you know all the good ventilation rates you know you have to dilute this you have to dilute it as much as possible and if you have got the recirculation system right you also are filtering it out so these are the things you know you can't catch that mrsa on its own you know you have to have these systems in place so that uh, you know uh, these get caught you know you got the hepa filters for that uh, so ultimately the uh, load of the mrsa i mean this you know the particles i'm not saying all are mrsa it leads to mrsa that's all i said so these particles have to be caught and that's what the hepa filter does you know it takes it through the return air and goes into the and some dilution occurs and then some also exfiltrates but it's uh, when it's exfiltrating into the nearby areas there also it's getting diluted so you have to count on these kind of strategies that in the first place you are filtering the air through a hepa filter as much as possible say and then you know some some very little quantities are also exfiltrating that is a reality of life but then that's what makes all the hospitals so dangerous thank you sir so your time is up i can't take any more questions so uh, <laughs> thank you sir for your wonderful presentation and thank you all 